get today's webinar, Seasonal Implications to Grazing, underway. For those that don't know me, I'm Jody Rizzo O'Brien, and I'm one of the Sheep Connect SA team. Sheep Connect SA is supported by Australian Wool Innovation, the South Australian Sheep Industry Fund, and the Department of Primary Industries and Regions. If you'd like to know more about Sheep Connect SA, you can go to our website, or you can follow us on Twitter at Sheep Connect SA. Today's webinar has been recorded and we will upload the recording to the Sheep Connect SA YouTube channel in the coming days. We welcome you to revisit the webinar yourself or share it with colleagues. Today's presenter is Deb Scammell, who's familiar to many of you. Deb's a livestock consultant at Talking Livestock based in the mid north. She assists producers with nutrition and production planning in their sheep and beef enterprises. And over the last few years, um, Deb has been keenly involved in improving performance in lamb feed lots, feeding, use and containment due to poor seasonal conditions. Prior to starting her own business, Deb worked in the commercial nutrition space in several different, several different roles, covering technical sales and national management of the ruminant business. Deb's also involved in a range of projects, including sheep genetics and DNA testing, EID tech, extension and sheep research. At this time, I'll hand over to Deb, who talked to us about summer um, implications of the season. Thanks, Deb. Thanks very much, Jodie, and thanks all for making time to listen at um, a very busy time of year. I'll just, um, I guess we, um, we were going to talk about summer grazing, and then over the last sort of month, um, you know, my phone's been running hot, really, with just the implications of this current season. So, you know, as you guys all know, a very different spring and coming into summer than what we've experienced in the past, even the fact that, you know, most people have only really just started reaping. Um, so I just wanted to touch on some of the issues we're likely to face and then some supplement tree feeding planning as we go through the season. So I'll be talking about feed quality, um, you know, dry pastures, stubbles, um, hay, and how we're going to handle the coming sort of few months of feeding, um, and also just touching on sort of mycotoxins. So we've obviously seen some varied quality of fodder, um, which is crucial to sort of understand what that means for livestock production. And then, as I said, just effective supplementation. So unfortunately, due to the dry feed being lower quality than what it usually is, um, supplementary feeding might need a little bit more focus than what it does in the past. So we'll cover that off a little bit also. So, you know, a common scene, um, you guys have all seen it. Well, unfortunately, there wasn't a lot of hay that was baled without having significant rain on it. So, um, yeah, I've sort of had... Um, you know, clients with, you know, some people did escape the rain altogether and managed to get a little bit of high quality hay in the shed. But, you know, most of the hay we're seeing has had between 25 and 120 mil on it, really, if not more. So um, we're looking at the implications of what that's done to fodder quality, but also some of the toxin levels that's in some of that hay. So we're seeing that real bleached, um, washed out sort of nutritional quality, but we're also seeing plenty of moulds and mycotoxins coming through in that fodder which can create many issues. So, you know, my feeling was at the time, um, you know, with baling hay, um, it was still worthwhile getting it in a bale, um, but now it becomes that process of how we use it and how we still optimise sort of livestock production with those sort of feeds. So um, I've put in this slide, um, I feel like it's my most widely used or the widely most widely used sort of industry slide, but just showing um, with our feed quality that, you know, we are very much getting into this bottom quadrant here. So the far right corner down the bottom. Um, so, you know, some of our feeds that were spray topped and things, you know, potentially were frozen at 60 to 65% digestibility. But the tough thing is I've had so much rainfall on them now, they've really deteriorated in quality. Um, and then, you know, a lot of our dry pastures are down already into that sort of 50% or less digestibility. So, you know, and even the hay, which I'll show you a few example feed tests, um, the hays are right down in that lower digestibility corner as well. So, you know, the spring's been great as far as, you know, some well grazed paddocks. You know, I've had people sowing brassicas that are starting to really add value now over, as a summer crop. Um, but, you know, the dry feed has taken a hit um, with that rainfall that we've had on it. So we'll go through this as we sort of um, go through um, what that means, that lower digestibility feed. 
So, you know, the biggest issue we had, obviously, in the hay making season was to cut it on time and then risk the rain, which, you know, as we said, most of it did probably get 80 to 100 mil, if not more, on it. Um, and then there was plenty of hay which was cut later. Um, but the issue with later cut hay is that, you know, going back to this slide, the optimum time of cutting hay is around flowering, um, where we've let it go on further the digestibility of that feed drops, the NDF increases as the stalks get longer. And then as you've got um, energy sort of going into grain, you'll find that the quality across that hay decreases quite significantly. So as far as, you know, some of it escapes some rain late cut, some of it still ended up with 40 mil on it. Um, but yet energy protein levels of that hay have still dropped just because of the stage the plant was at when it was cut, which was way past the optimum time. So, you know, my feeling is still very handy feed to have in a bale, but we've got to understand the limitations that this is going to give us for animal performance. So the problem as feed gets more fibrous, basically from a nutritional perspective, an animal can consume a whole lot less and then each mouthful they are getting is a lot lower quality. So your energy protein's down per mouthful. So when you're trying to hit an energy protein target, it's really difficult with fibrous, low quality hay. So the next issue I've seen is, you know, we had a pretty amazing spring in most areas. Um, you know, feed got away from most stock. Um, you just couldn't keep the grazing pressure up to it because we just kept getting that rain. Um, the problem is, you know, off, a lot of people sort of spray top barley grass and things a couple of times because it just kept reshooting from the base. Um, so I love spray topping as a tactic to stop sort of weed seeds, but also preserve the feed quality. Um, but it also obviously preserves that quantity that, that's there. Um, but the risk of spray topping is always if you get those rain events afterwards, it does deplete the quality quite quickly from that dried feed. So you know, where you've potentially frozen it at sort of 65% digestibility, um, you know, which can give you sort of eight to nine megajoules of energy per kilo of dry matter. What we found is that each rain event, you'll lose about a megajoule of energy. So a lot of these paddocks that had a huge bulk, uh, you know, should have been giving us reasonable quality through the later part of the year, um, you know, probably now are down around that 45 to 55% digestibility. So you're back in that, you know, very low quality feed of, you know, five to six megajoules of energy per kilo dry matter. So, you know, plenty of phone calls coming in about stock that have sat on a spray top paddock and, um, you know, ewe lambs growing stock and they're just not doing well on it. So unfortunately, a lot of the quality has been depleted from that feed. So looking at some of the hay results, so um, it's been an interesting year for hay because, you know, normally I'd have about 40 feed tests by now where um, I'm really only just starting to get some of them in as people are managing to get fodder in a bale. So uh, we're starting to get a bit of a picture of where the hay is, but, you know, as we all expected, the quality was going to be pretty low. So um, what we're seeing, this is just a localish wheat and hay um, cut a little bit late, um, a little bit of rain on it, but not significant. I think it had an inch or two of rain on it. Um, but as you can see there, we look at that crude protein level there, 4.8% um, of dry matter. So, you know, I'd normally hope for cereal hay to be around that 9 to 10% protein. Um, so, you know, half of that. So, you know, as a comparison, cereal straw will often be that four to five, even 6% protein. So, you know, when you're looking at a protein level coming in from that, it's equivalent of your straw that you would have cut last year. Um, the next thing I look at is the NDF, which is the neutral detergent fibre shown here. Um, so once again, cut a little bit late, um, got a bit stalky, quite a lot of fibre in that stalk. Um, the fibre level has got quite high as well. So a really high quality cereal hay will be that 50 to 55% NDF. Um, with this hay, we're looking at 61.2%. And then, as I said, your digestibility here. So when we talk digestibility, that's basically the proportion of feed that an animal will retain. And then the rest of the feed goes out in their manure. So um, you know, a high digestible hay, um, you know, you could be up that 60, 65, you know, even 70 or higher, some legume hay. 
Um, but here we're looking at only 50% of it being utilised by the ruminant and 50% basically going out the back end. So when you look per kilo of dry matter, that's only giving us seven megajoules of energy. So, you know, I think this is where we're going to see a lot of our cereal haze this year, um, if they have been a bit late cut or had decent amounts of rainfall on them. So, you know, that's the only things you really need to worry about on your feed test when we're looking at formulating for a ruminant ration. Um, so another example here, so this is just another um, slightly north um, oat and hay, wintery oat and hay. Um, so yeah, cut um, early, significant rainfall on it. Um, you know, this is the feed central visual grade. So you can see there visually, it's not looking that great, probably pretty bleached, not a lot of colour left, which has happened with those significant rain events we had on the hay when it was laying down. So you can see there your energy level. Um, we've got 7.8 energy. Um, NDF even higher, so getting pretty close to 70% NDF. So, you know, that's back to a fibre level um, that you'd see in your straw. And protein slightly better there at 7.7, .7, but yeah, still far from a high quality hay. But, you know, not to be all doom and gloom, we can still make a lot of use of these hays um, as roughage for ruminants, but we just need to understand the limitations for growing stock and pregnant use. So the reason NDF can create so many issues, as I said, when you've got a really fibrous feed, it basically means animals can have a limited quantity that they can fit through the rumen. So because it's so fibrous, it takes up a lot of space and it also takes a long time for those rumen bugs to sort of break it down. So um, what we do with NDF, there's a really good equation, which is just a standard equation that was developed on dairy cows. Um, so that's 120 divided by the NDF of the hay or straw or paddock feed, whatever you've feed tested, will give you the percent of body weight they can consume. So to put it into perspective, you know, a lamb in a feedlot will eat sort of three and a half to four percent of their body weight with an energy dense, you know, high grain ration or a full feed pellet, which means they grow quite well. Um, with this hay, so the second hay I showed you that was 69.5 NDF. Um, if we use that equation, 120 divided by 69.5, they're only getting 1.7% of their body weight that they can consume per day. So if you think about that with a, you know, pretty standard 65 kilo merino, mid-north merino ewe, um, that will be only 1.1 kilos of that hay they can eat a day. Um, and with that only being seven megajoules of energy, that means you'll only be getting 7.7 .7 megajoules of energy per day for that ewe. So we're going to cover off a little bit later um, some supplementary feeding and requirements, but, um, you know, a standard 65 kilo ewe needs 10 a day of energy um, to maintain its condition. So if they're only getting 7.7, .7, you're going to be drastically losing condition on that hay. So, you know, last year the hay quality was good enough for singles to lamb down. So you know, with an oat and hay, we were getting sort of 14 to 15 megajoules of energy per day. Um, so, you know, significant difference between the hay cut last year and this year. So what about mycotoxins? I feel like, um, you know, piggeries, um, people that run chickens, poultry sheds, um, are very aware of mycotoxins. I think in the ruminant, you know, probably in the dairy space, they're quite aware of them too, anywhere where it's really intensively fed animals. Um, so I guess the question, do they matter to ruminants? So um, when we look at mycotoxins, they're basically all these types of moulds and there are some main ones that can affect um, ruminants that we will sort of focus on today. So as you can see there, um, you've got that huge range of moulds um, that you see, and they've also got varying colours. So down the bottom there, we've got what we call often safer type moulds, but they can still create issues. Um, but they're normally the whites. Um, you've got some blacks and some greys. Um, you know, I still like to look at mould levels because even the moulds that don't generally create issues can if they're at higher levels. But as we move further up that chart, we've got the fusarium, um, the white to pinkish white moulds. Um, so these are the ones I'll talk a little bit more about today. So we've got the Zorallanone, um, 
and the next one I'm just going to abbreviate is Don. I've got its proper name written out in a few slides, but it's a pretty hard one to say. Um, and that can produce extremely sort of potent toxins. And all of these um, mycotoxins will affect various things as far as production, reproduction, um, younger animals, older animals. So, you know, being aware of what's tracking in your fodder or even paddock feed um, means you can make sure you keep high risk animals off the paddocks or take, um, you know, look at ways you can minimise the risk. So the next one up, the aspergillus, is yellowish and green. Um, that's an aflatoxin. Um, so yeah, both the two that I've just looked at were both very common this season um, with the wet and then we've had a bit of heat. And, you know, obviously with your hay in rows and things, it's just all sat underneath and um, been able to get quite humid sort of conditions which creates these mould. Um, the top one, penicillium, um, so that green to greenish blue and also some very high toxins. So that's probably more common in silage. So when we look at moulds and mycotoxins, um, a lot of people will go and do a mould count. So you can actually send your fodder in for testing and then get a mould count, which will give you the number of spores and the quantity of mould within a kilo of that feed. And looking at the mould count and the quantity of it, they'll then determine if it's safe or unsafe to feed. So um, this is the material that Feedworks have reviewed um, and put into a table, but you can see there, you know, 10 to 10,000 spores is relatively safe. Um, you know, once you get up to 100,000, starting to get to be a bit of an issue, but they think still safe-ish, um, you know, up to the 500,000, they're starting to look for clinical signs, um, up to a million sort of feed with caution, and then over a million, um, you know, if they were relying purely on that silage or hay or grain that had been infected, you'd probably start to have some issues. And then over five million, they're saying avoid feeding. So when we look at ruminants, um, they are a lot more able to cope with mycotoxin burdens compared to your monogastric intensively fed animals, but they're still not bulletproof. Like I think that's what we need to remember is you can't, you are going to affect production if you keep feeding these higher level um, counts or these higher levels of specific mycotoxins. So, you know, a mold you can get done at forage labs. I've got some um, links at the end that if you're interested in getting some feed tests done, you can. Um, the other option is actually to test for the type of mycotoxin. So, you know, personally, I've been more so sending hay to get the types of mycotoxins isolated. So a mould count will give you a good idea of how effective the feed is, but it won't tell you which of the mycotoxins. And then, as you can see from these three different mycotoxins, there's a very different function of what they affect if you've got those levels. So the aflatoxin, um, which is a quite common one, um, that's likely to cause liver damage, gastrointestinal dysfunction. So you'll see reduced productivity. Um, you can get a decrease in reproductive performance, but um, potentially more product productivity issues, decreased feed utilisation and efficiency, and also a suppressed immune function. So you know, if you imagine lambs in a feedlot, for example, uh, you know, you could find their growth rates are slowing up. They're not doing as well as they should. But also if something comes through, um, they're going to also have a suppressed immune function. So if you get, you know, a weather event, you might see more pneumonia and things because they're already suffering a bit from this aflatoxin in their feed. So, you know, if you're feeding stock and trying to get them to put on weight, um, fodder with aflatoxin in it wouldn't be ideal. Um, you know, especially with where it looks like grain and hay prices will be versus land prices, um, some of this stuff will really affect um, anything intensive you're going to do with lambs, I think. So the next one, which is the one we're seeing probably the highest levels of this year, is zerelinone. Um, So this actually has an e effect on reproduction. So it'll mimic the female hormone that they produce naturally, which is estrogen. But the problem is if you're using an external mycotoxin um, that's mimicking estrogen, it can actually interfere with the ability for you to ovulate, conceive um, during joining. 
pregnancy implantation, but also fetal development. So you may see abortions um, at high levels, even as the fetus is going through. So, you know, the, the haze I've tested so far have all come up high on xerelinone. And, you know, I'm a bit nervous when you look at things like containment. If you've got high quantities of that in your ration, I think it's worth looking at. Now, the last one that I can't really say, um, we'll just use the abbreviation DON. Um, so this is also quite common, has quite a detrimental effect on ruminants. So you're going to get your feed refusal, reduced growth rates, you'll see some diarrhoea and sort of digestive dysfunction. So again, you know, a ewe with a little bit of feed with that in it, diluted in the paddock might be fine. But if you put young lambs, um, pregnant ewes in a pen and they're relying just on that feed source, you'd have to be pretty careful. So, yeah, that's the major three. Um, obviously, a few others, but they're the main ones that will affect um, ruminant performance and especially pregnancy with that middle one. So, um, there's all tech, Lena will do a quick rapid read assessment. So, um, I think they're the only South Australian company that will do it. It's about $90 a sample, um, and you'll get the results sort of within a week. But that'll actually isolate the mycotoxins you're dealing with. Um, they do have a more comprehensive 37, I think it is, mycotoxin test you can do, but um, I think it's overseas still. So, you know, as a local quick way of estimating risk, um, this is what I've sort of currently been using. So what you get is basically an assessment based on the class of animals you're going to feed. So this assessment is for calves. Um, and basically, I wanted it for young animals. So, you know, if you're going to be feeding this to lambs or calves, this is sort of where your risk comes up. So you can see there we've got, um, you know, between low and moderate level of aflatoxin. So the graph at the bottom here, um, can you see my cursor, Jody? Certainly can, Deb. Yeah, cool. Yeah. So the bottom green there, the aflatoxin, you can see, you know, it's 6.3. Um, that's still in the lower risk category for that one. Um, so, you know, I wouldn't worry too much about that. But then when we get into these other things, we've got Don here um, that's sitting up in the moderate risk. So, you know, probably still not a huge issue. Um, but with this Xerelinone, um, you're up here in the higher risk category. So, um, you know, if that was pregnant stock you're looking at, um, then, you know, that would definitely be an issue with that feed and we're trying to look at a tactic of how you can reduce the risk. Um, so this thing here, the REQ, that's the risk equivalent quantity. So they're basically quantifying the overall risk of that feed. And you can see that feed is high risk just because of those levels of Zarela 9. Um, so if we ran this same assessment for cows, um, they are a lot more tolerant to mycotoxins and also just their pure size. Um, you may not have the same level of risk. So, yeah, they'll basically run your risk depending on, you know, use, mature ewes, lambs, um, cattle, and you'll get a bit of an assessment back on that. So, you know, I found that quite handy because, you know, my feeling is if we know there's a bit of mould, um, we know it could be an issue, but if I know there's xerelinone, it's helping me look at with pregnant stock, we'll try and reduce the risk for those animals, but we might keep feeding it to mature stock that aren't pregnant. So I um, just wanted to touch on a few of these other things. So, you know, one that's a bit forgotten here, um, and we spoke about it last year as well, is just lupinosis. So, you know, I saw a lot of lupinosis on stubbles last year, and we've and again, we've just got perfect conditions for lupinosis. We've just had all that spring rain, there's so much moisture, um, you know, throwing a bit of heat. Um, and if you leave paddocks for quite a while before you graze. Um, so it's just this fungus here. Um, you'll see very clearly a black spot on a stem. So if you do have leaf and stubbles, I encourage you, go look at the leftover grain. They'll get a black fungus on them too um, and the stem. And, you know, I'm pretty cautious with lupinosis. So I, it can cause liver disease and quite sudden death. So, you know, if you've got relatively high quantities of the black on the stem, you know, I probably don't really graze it. Um, you know, you can graze just till they've consumed all the grain, but once they're getting low on grain, it's extremely high risk to graze a stubble with lupinosis on it. 
And then obviously this bottom left corner here, um, you know, I've seen a lot of hay that's just been left in paddocks. So just that awareness that, you know, if they're, if they're eating the top half, that's probably quite good, not too um, mouldy, probably fine. Um, but don't leave them in the paddock for ages um, because they're going to get down to this mouldy stuff and you're going to start having those issues even in a paddock. So, um, you know, just looking at your stock and making sure you're not grazing too hard those areas, you know, you're going to have mould issues. So tactics with mycotoxin levels. So, you know, I think, um, you know, two out of three haze I've tested have had relatively high levels of mycotoxins. Um, so I think it's just something we're going to have to get our heads around this year. Um, so the tactics we can use is diluting the feed. So, you know, if we had a hay with that high level of xarela known that we saw, um, you know, if that's 10% of the ration and you've got some barley that's great and you've got some other hay that hasn't been too weather affected, um, you know that level is diluting across the whole ration. So you might assess your risk as being low and not worry too much about doing anything. But you know, if you're putting out all your fibre sources have high mycotoxin levels, um, or if you're feeding to pregnant ewes and you're a bit risk adverse, I'd um, encourage looking at mycotoxin binders. So what mycotoxin binders do is they actually absorb and bind um, to the mycotoxin. So they're, they're made, there's plenty of companies that have binders, some better than others. Um, so, you know, some of the old ones were things like bentonite, which are just clay-based. So they'll bind some of your really common mycotoxins, your aflatoxins, but they won't do your don and your xerella known. So the problem is you do need a more complex binder if you're looking at those different types of mycotoxins, which, you know, from what I've seen this year, it is that xerella known that we're trying to bind in most cases. So um, it's... The binding potential of the binder will depend on its chemical structure and how it looks. So basically you feed them to the room and they go into the room and the structure of it has plenty of absorption sites and then the mycotoxins actually absorb to that rather than being released into the bloodstream of the animal and starting to cause damage. So, um, yeah, looking at a, a binder that's got um, efficacy against all of your potential mycotoxins is a start. Um, and then we also need binders that are specific. So when you look at some of the old sort of clay-based binders, um, they would also bind vitamins and microminerals and things. So you'd actually find, you know, say in a feedlot or intensive feeding facility, um, you actually start to lose a bit of nutritional value um, because they're affecting your actual ration as well. So you know, I guess the key is, you know, look for something proven against a wide range of mycotoxins and also look at something specific that's not going to interfere with the rest of your nutrition with that animal. But yeah, so that would be my tactic. Um, you know, already some of the stuff we've tested that's come back high level, um, and because I do a lot of containment feeding rations, um, we'll just put in a mycotoxin binder just because, you know, when you're spending, you know, I guess we're spending 20 to 50 cents per year per day on containment feeding rations, depending on where they are in pregnancy. Um, you know, I look for a mature ewe, depending on what brand you go for and what rate you're using, um, two to five cents per head per day additional cost. Um, cattle, 10 to 14 cents per head per day. And if you're doing a feedlot ration or sort of a TMR, you're looking at 10 to $15 um, inclusion per tonne of feed to put in a mycotoxin binder in your sort of total mix ration. So, you know, Frustrating is an additional expense, but I think when you're feeding high risk animals, growing lambs or pregnant ewes, um, you know, it depends on your risk aversion, but it would just make sure you're covered if you know you're running high with molds and mycotoxins. So I'm Deb, gonna... sorry, I might just interrupt. Yep. Questions come in. What form do the um, binders come in? So they are powder or are they liquid? What what do they look like? Yeah. You, so yeah. um most companies will sell them as a powder um, and then they often can go into products. So um, plenty of loose licks will be formulated. Um, there's a few on the market already. There's more that will have the option of adding a binder. So, you know, in a paddock situation or even containment situation where you're not doing a total mixed ration, you could have a loose lick and just get the binder added in. Um, in a 
in a full feed pellet, you'd have the option of getting that formulated in and then pelleted. So I don't know of any that come in a pellet form already um, because they are a very low add rate. So you're better off to add it to a full feed pellet or add it to an existing loose leak to get it out at the correct rate. Thank you. Is I can see a bit in the chat. Is there anything else you want to ask before I head no, on? No, that was the only one that's come through to me yeah, at this cool. stage. Thanks. Yeah. Um, so I'm just going to touch on animal requirements. So as I said, you know, I'm sure there's hopefully a few producers listening that have managed to cut exceptional quality hay and are not the um, common theme that I'm sort of covering off on. But, you know, as I said, that awareness with hay quality um, and paddock feed quality, that if it is such low, so much lower quality than last year, we really need to get our feeding right to make sure we're still hitting animal requirements. So um, just wanted to touch on this and how we can overcome those issues with low feed quality. So, you know, as I said, this is a 60 kilo U. So, you know, when we're looking at a dry U, you're sitting at around that 10 megajoules per day energy requirement. So, you know, when we look at energy, it's basically, you know, similar to calories in a human. If you have more energy than what you need per day, you're going to put on weight. If you've got less energy than what you need per day, they're going to lose weight. So, you know, throwing them in a pen and giving them that high fibrous, low quality hay, um, you know, most ewes are going to start to lose weight. Um, so we need to look at ways we can meet their energy requirements, especially as we get up through that pregnancy curve. So, you know, we've got the single shown here, this dotted line, twins at the top. Um, you know, so when you're getting up to these higher levels required at lambing, you know, depending on what the break of the season does next year, um, you know, potentially hay is not going to cut it. So pointing out as well on this one, um, we've also got this protein requirement. So, um, you know, that's where I think we're going to struggle a little bit with, you know, growing lambs and things on stubble. So, you know, as your hay is depleted, so too of your stubble. So when you look at that protein and energy content, that's in the stalk of the hay, that's going to be pretty reflective of what's left in your paddocks to graze. So, you know, you're going to be at that real low level, low digestible feed. Um, and, you know, as we saw from that hay, you know, the worst one at four and a half percent, a growing lamb needs, you know, this 14 to 16 percent protein. So, you know, you're going to have to look at high protein supplements to bring it up to that. So this table, um, department in WA did a trial on this um, to look at what sort of quantity of feed an animal can consume. So, you know, based on the quality of feed, but also the feed on offer available. So when we talk on feed on offer, um, we're looking at kilos of dry matter available per hectare. So, um, you know, basically we just cut in a quadrant, which is 0.1 of a square metre. The quantity of dry feed, you know, most of your dry feed is about 90% dry matter and only about 10% more moisture once it's dried out. Um, so, yeah, we look at what's available. And then, as I said, the digestibility is the amount that animal can utilise and the rest is going straight out in their manure. So, you know, as I said, we're really in this 45, you know, 50, maybe some part dry pastures are still 55% digestibility but I think a lot will be lower than that. So when you look at a U needing sort of 10 megajoules um, of energy, you know, you're needing 2,000 or two tonne of dry matter, basically, at 55% digestibility, you're only just going to get that nine megajoules a day. So, you know, I think realistically, most of us over the next few months with any dry feed, so hills feed, sown dry pastures, you know, spray top paddocks that have had a lot of rain on them are all going to be sitting in this range. So, you know, you're looking at short dry feed, low digestibility, you're only going to get 1.8 megajoules per day up to, you know, best case two tonne at 50%, you're going to get 7.3 megajoules per day. So, you know, any mature animal um, that's dry and any growing lamb is going to lose a significant amount of weight on those pastures without some supplementary feed. So obviously when we talk about dry feed, um, you know, a lot of people finally opening up a few stubbles at the moment. So, 
you know, when we look at dry pastures, they're going to need some supplement. Um, depending on the grain quantity in your stubbles, you potentially will have enough grain there initially to meet that shortfall of the low leaf and straw quality in your stubbles and what a ewe needs to maintain or potentially what a growing net lamb needs to grow. But it's important to do a bit of a count or have a little bit of an idea of what grain quantity you do there because stubbles change so much in quality year to year. So I know a few areas we've had a bit of hail damage, weather damage, you know, potentially you could have high tonnages of grain on the ground, uh, which will make up for that shortfall. But what I find in most areas now with our reaping equipment being a lot better than what it was in the past, um, you often find you just don't have a lot of grain underneath. So I'm not going to go into this too much. It's just a bit of a reminder, um, but I do have a link to a document at the end that if you want to do some grain counts and budgets, you can work your way through that. But basically what we look at is that same quadrant that's 0.1 of a square metre. Um, so 40 centimetres by 25 centimetres is the quadrant I use. Um, and you just literally count the grains within that square. So to have 100 kilos per hectare of grain, across the paddock, in that 0.1 of a square metre, you'd have to have between 25 to 28 cereal grains, and that depends. So 25 and barley's your 28, um, five peas or two beans. So, you know, by throwing your quadrant around the paddock and doing 10 or 20 counts, um, you may be surprised, you know, if you're seeing three cereal grains within that quadrant, um, the grain, is really not adding any value to the nutrition of those animals because at that point they're not even able to find it. So, you know, it can be good just to have a bit of a look, you know, even just visualise a square and go, yeah, we've got 50 to 60 grains. We've got ample, you know, for three, four weeks for a big mob or um, we've got two, we might have to supplement pretty quickly or move these stock on. So just good to keep an eye on where it's sitting so your stock don't lose a heap of weight. Um, so obviously, you know, green, we're not sure what's going to happen yet, but as far as quality, your grain's the highest quality in your stubble, um, you know, then green weeds or any shot grain, um, flag leaf and header trash. So, you know, your leaf often is about six megajoules. I reckon this year we're going to be substantially lower than that. So you might be four to five megajoules per kilo dry matter in the leaf and the standing straw really is going to be next to useless. So. You know, I think just monitoring how we graze the stubble so you're not losing significant weight. But yeah, I guess monitoring, and the best way is to obviously look at the condition of your stock. So, um, and you know, monitoring the paddocks so they're not left out there for three weeks too long, which can be pretty tough when most of you guys are gonna be reaping as well. So one last thing to touch on is just your mineral supplementation. So. When we look at minerals, um, a lot of the dry feed, as we said, is going to be just depleted with nutritional quality in general. So your energy protein's been washed out of it. Most of your minerals will be washed out of it. Um, and, you know, when we look at cereal stubbles and, you know, bean and your pea stubbles, they're very deficient in salt and calcium anyway. So I always like to have as a minimum just salt and calcium out over summer. Um, and we've found it has a extremely positive benefit to use status as they come into pregnancy and we've found it's had um, a big effect sort of on new losses to hypocalcemia around lambing so you know any time they're on a deficient feed I like to keep the salt and calcium up to them um, you know micro minerals can add some value especially for growing stock but not always an issue for your mature use often you can just get away with your um, bare minimum there the other thing is urea supplementation. So, you know, I think a lot of people will use dry blocks, dry licks over summer, which can add a whole lot of value. Um, but you need to ask yourself the question you know, whether you've got a small shortfall in nutrition or whether you've got a significant shortfall and they're going to be better with some supplementary feed. So when you look at urea, um, what it will do is it basically provides a non-protein nitrogen source um, that'll feed the rumen bugs um, in that ewe or, or lamb or whatever the class of stock is. 
and it will basically allow the rumen to break down a bit more dry feed by providing that sort of extra protein. But if you're severely deficient in protein, um, you know, the little bit of urea that comes through a liquid block probably won't be enough. And that's where you need to look at feeders or, you know, some high protein hay or something to supplement those stocks. So, you know, when we're looking at situations where, you know, some of those numbers I showed you in the graph, like 45% digestibility, and only 500 kilos of pasture, they're going to get, it was 1.8 megajoules per day. A urea lick isn't going to allow you to get the other eight megajoules per day or the protein the animal needs to keep their condition. So just you need to have a think about what's going to help. And obviously growing lambs, um, a true protein source like lupins through a feeder um, is maybe going to be better than just a urea supplement in the paddock. But yeah, if you've got a stubble that's got pretty good grain amounts, you're looking at just a bit of a boost, then you know, a high calcium loose lick with some urea can be an exceptional product. So it's just horses for courses, I guess. So when we look at supplementation, um, I guess looking at what the shortfall is um, that your animals is gonna lack its performance. And I've got no problem with, when we talk feed testing, we always talk about grain and hay, um, but don't be afraid to cut some of your dry pasture, throw it in a bag, um, and get it feed tested because it will help you work out where you are really lacking. So as I said, you know, some of that dry pasture might only be 5% protein, protein, five megajoules of energy. If you get the NDF, they might only be eating just over a kilo a day. Um, you know, if it's a growing lamb, looking at, you know, potentially lupins or beans or some high protein fodder is going to help them with that shortfall. Um, you know, if it's a ewe, then we've got a medium sort of 10% protein requirement, but we're looking more at energy Then something like your barley grain or oats or triticale or wheat might be a better product to supplement. So looking at what you're trying to achieve with those animals, what their requirements are, what the shortfall is, um, we then choose the most effective supplement to fill that gap. And obviously, you know, when we do things like looking at effective supplementation, the cost of the grain also comes into it. So, you know, once we get a firm idea, um, as we get into harvest of where the prices are all going to sit, um, you know, then a professional can work out sort of a least cost supplement ration for you, depending on your paddock feed. So finishing up, um, the key take homes from today was just, Firstly, what feed quality have you got stored? So if you haven't already feed tested your hay, I encourage you to feed test the hay. Um, and then whether you need to do a mould or mycotoxin test um, will depend a bit on how that hay appears. So, you know, if it appears that there's no moulds at all, but if, if, it is, if it is a bit musty and, you know, doesn't smell great, then it may be worth getting as a minimum sort of a mould count to make sure it's not going to be an issue to the stock you're going to feed it to. And again, if you're buying hay or fodder this season, I think really making sure you're looking at those feed tests because, you know, I've already seen some quite good hay advertised at extremely high prices, um, you know, and there's a lot of average hay around as well. So, you know, if you're paying per tonne, I think it's going to be more crucial than ever knowing what you're actually getting. Um, if I asked a hay seller for a feed test and they weren't willing to provide one, I'd get pretty nervous about what that quality is going to be. Um, also, what feed quality is in the paddock? So as we've covered, just that awareness that the stubble quality is going to be low this year. Um, your dry pastures have had most of the nutrition washed out of them. Um, you know, you may not get away with just keeping them on the paddocks you have in the past and still maintaining conditions. So, you know, I guess what's in the paddock, but also the key is just monitor condition of your ewes and lambs as well. Um, and then are mycotoxins likely to affect your livestock this year? So, you know, plenty of phone calls I've had about mycotoxins. Um, you know, once we get test results back, I think, you know, for some of these pregnant rations where they're relying heavily on a fodder source, we'll be looking at binders that are going to be effective in that situation. And then, you know, if you are supplementing, looking at least cost, but also what's the best supplement for you. So is it a urea leak? Is it, you know, 300 grams of lupins a day for some lambs? Or is it, you know, a couple hundred grams of barley just to keep the ewes kicking on over summer? So, you know, my 
aim with supplementation is always a little bit early rather than leaving it too late and realising the ewes have dropped a condition score over the stubble grazing period. So yeah, hopefully that's answered some of your questions. But lastly, I just wanted to put up some of these um, companies I've sort of referred to just so you guys can find some further information. So Forage Labs Australia is at Bendigo. Um, so they'll do the mould count. So you'll get those levels to know when you're sort of high risk. Um, All Tech Lena based at Roseworthy. Um, so they now do the Rappi Reed mycotoxin test in-house. So that's quite handy for South Australians to get a pretty quick result there. Um, so feed test, I use, so Forage Labs will do a nutritional test. Um, I personally use feed test. They're about $60 a sample um, plus GST. And they'll also do mycotoxin counts. And then the stubble grazing document I referred to um, is a project up in North Farming Systems did a while ago. And that's a really good methodology of counting grains and then working out how many days um, you'll get on a stubble paddock. But yeah, when Jody sends out the recording, um, yeah, we might send that out. So if anyone needs any further links, they can click on all of those links. Yeah, thank you very much for your time and I'll hand over to Jody to take any questions. Um, Deb, a few questions about binders. The first one, just to recap, adding binders, is that for what classes of livestock? Just pregnant animals? Um, was the um, question? So it would really depend on that risk. So um, some of the early tests I got, which was on sort of vetch hay through the mallee that had uh, over 100 mil of rain on it, we didn't end up but none of it got bailed in the end um, and people putting lambs out on the paddock. Um, but that was enough risk to kill a lamb sort of pretty quickly um, and would have had a severe influence on the health of an older ewe. So if that's where I probably quite like that risk profile because um, depending on the class of stock, the levels of mycotoxins that are an issue will change. So, you know, my... I'm using binders mostly on lambs or pregnant ewes because the levels haven't yet been high enough. But as I said, some of the levels of that real slimy hay that may have been baled early, you potentially would have to use that also on an older ewe. Rightio, next questions. Um, in res about binders and um, reducing essential the availability of essential nutrients or the absorption yep. of? Did you want yeah, to make a so, comment on that, on that? Yeah, probably the newer ones. Um, so newer binders are more, there's a bit of clay, silicate, sort of algae-based products. So um, they're kind of created, I guess, not to be detrimental to other nutritional products. So they're very targeted. Um, but, you know, very common is binding of vitamins. So they'll basically bond to the mycotoxin binder if it's one of the older sort of binders. Um, and, you know, I like bentonite as a good example because that was a clay that was used for everything. So used as a buffer, you know, used as a mycotoxin binder. It will bind aflatoxin and some of those basic ones. But, you know, when you look at things like bentonite, it actually fills their gut up with clay. They feel full and their feed efficiency and production will go down. So, you know, even without taking away specific micro minerals or vitamins, you're going to have issues with even just feed intake with some of those old clay-based products. But yeah, vitamins are probably the most common um, with some of the binders that they're not targeted specifically to mycotoxins. But that's yeah. great. No, that's all the questions. Um, um, I'd like to thank you all for joining today's webinar. Deb, I thank you once again for sharing your insight and expertise with us all. And as I said, if you've got any additional questions, you can contact us directly through the contact information on your webinar registration, or Deb has kindly popped her contact details up there, flick her a text or an email. Um, thank you for your time this evening and have a wonderful evening. Mm -hmm.